nation's capital, the Conservative Caucus presents Conservative Roundtable, an in-depth look at today's most important issues. Welcome to Conservative Roundtable. I'm Howard Phillips, Chairman of the Conservative Caucus. I'm delighted to have as my guest for this broadcast my son, Brad Phillips, who is the founder and head of the Persecution Project Foundation. Brad, let's get right into it. Uh, recently, World Magazine reported that you had a meeting with President Bush <laughs> and uh, you had the opportunity to present him with a burned Bible that you had recovered on your most recent trip to the Sudan. Well, I actually had recovered it on a previous trip, but, okay. but it, was, uh, it was a relatively recent trip and it was a, it was a, uh, a great opportunity to present him with some physical <clears throat> evidence of the persecution in Sudan. I, I didn't uh, know if I would have <clears throat> a chance to uh, give him a full briefing, so I wanted to give him something that would get his attention and, and draw his attention to the fact that Christians are dying in Sudan because of their faith. Uh, what did the president say? Well, and what he, did you say to I, him? I, in, in the 90 <clears throat> seconds that I had with him, I tried to uh, explain to him the gravity of the situation and, and the fact that uh, there wasn't one set of bombings, but there, were, uh, there was a pattern of terror and coercion that was going on in Sudan. Um, I was uh, impressed on the fact that as a chief executive, uh, he's sort of living in a bubble. So what he knew about Sudan was very little. His comments were very gracious to me. His comments to the group were very gracious to us, and he acknowledged that it was really because of our pressure that he relented and signed the Sudan Peace Act, uh, knowing all along that it was the right thing, but but having to uh, please all sorts of different uh, uh, people. So um, I think he's sympathetic. The problem is, of course, uh, the people around him are not sympathetic and personal Who were some of the policy. other people uh, in the room when you were there? Well, one of the people in the room was Walter Kansteiner. And Walter Kansteiner is going to be speaking in a few days at the Heritage Foundation. And the title of his talk is Resolving Conflicts in Africa Is Sudan a Model? And what the State Department... Who is, is Kansteiner? Walter Kansteiner is the Assistant Secretary of State <clears throat> for Africa uh, selected by President Bush. Um, and, uh, he used to work with Brent Scowcroft, and yeah. he's in the Chester Crocker, Herman Cohen tradition. Yes, he's in that same school of thought, and he's been causing the same sort of problems uh, for American policy towards Africa and for those people over there. And the State Department did more than any, any, uh, anyone else to try to block the passage of the Sudan Peace Act in its original form. Uh, but once they knew it had to be signed, uh, after a neutered version of it was signed by the president, they're now trying to claim victory for peace in Sudan. And of course, the Sudan Peace Act is largely a symbolic act, and it's totally up to the discretion of the executive branch on how it is implemented. It is yet to be implemented. So there really has been no substantive change in Africa, but already we're seeing uh, at the Heritage Foundation and, other, and elsewhere uh, uh, peace has been delivered by the State Department, by Senator Danforth and by Walter Kansteiner, and it couldn't be further from the truth. Just last week, um, the State Department coerced the rebels and the National Islamic Front regime to sign a document which, on paper, uh, claimed a victory, claimed that there had been 80 percent of the outstanding issues agreed to. And again, they're just trying to present this as a policy victory uh, for themselves and for the Bush administration, and nothing of substance has been changed. And I guess Colin Powell and Condoleezza Rice were also at this meeting which you attended. Yeah, there, was, uh, there were essentially two groups of people. There were people uh, from the Bush administration and then there were about 30 uh, activists in Congress and out of Congress who were the ones who were responsible for uh, uh, getting the Sudan Peace Act uh, enacted. And um, with his words, he was gracious to us, but with the presence of the other people in the room who really will be formulating the policy, we could see the contradiction. And even as he said that his, he was with us, supported, he supported us, he supported the rights of Christians being persecuted in Sudan um, with his actions by the people that he's appointed around him, he's contradicted himself. And when I went to uh, the White House website to get the 
the, uh, the text of his remarks, which were really excellent remarks. Instead, what I found was the official statement, which essentially said, uh, disclaimer, 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 the <clears throat> president has signed the Sudan Peace Act, but he will not be bound by it, and it's up to his discretion on how it will be implemented. So, uh, again, we're seeing uh, uh, schizophrenia. Brad, I'm, I'm reading a very interesting book about the Sudan. Uh, the headline is Emma. It's about a British humanitarian worker in the Sudan, and this, uh, this book is extremely well written, and it gives the history of anti-slavery efforts in the Sudan, particularly in the 19th century and, and what the British attempted to do, the role of Egypt, et cetera, et cetera. But as I read the book, I was reminded of some of the films you've produced. You've produced how many, five or six films? It's about seven, uh, seven if films. you can call them films. They're um, documentaries, and, and <clears throat> uh, some of them are more documentary than others. But, uh, and uh, in, a, in one or more of them, you focus uh, on the energy issue as a key to what's been happening in the Sudan. And I was reminded of your insight on that when I read the book. And one of the revelations in the book is that all the way back in the 1970s, when George Bush was Richard Nixon's ambassador to the United Nations, the elder Bush, he visited with the then president of the Sudan, Namiri, was that his name? Yes. And uh, he told Namiri that their uh, satellite imaging had discovered oil in many areas of the Sudan and that the United States wanted to advise him of this, urge him to do something, and he recommended that Namiri work with the Chevron Corporation in exploiting the oil. And of course, you and I have worked <coughs> to help the freedom fighters in Angola <coughs> <clears throat> as well as in the Sudan, and we've always bumped up against the Chevron Corporation, which has had great influence in Republican presidencies. People like Condoleezza Rice, after whom they named a tanker. Uh, Walter Kansteiner. Walter Kansteiner, George Shultz, Carla Hills. Prominent Republicans have been brought in and have been enriched by their association with Chevron, and the Republican Party has put Chevron profits ahead of the human rights of the people in that area, indeed ahead of our own national interest, because Sudan has been a country that has harbored terrorists, it's harbored al-Qaeda, it's harbored Osama bin Laden, and we've been afraid or unwilling to take them on lest we disrupt some of the oil arrangements. One other thing before I let you respond to that, I was gratified to see that in part because of the pressures that you developed, Talisman Oil of Canada has now withdrawn from the Sudan. Yes, it has, and uh, it was a very similar campaign campaign to the one that you conducted against Chevron in the 1980s, that resulted in in Talisman, uh, the Canadian company, uh, in withdrawing uh, from Sudan. Um, there's no question that bad pennies keep turning up. Uh, there are so many similarities to uh, the crisis in Sudan, to the one in Angola. Uh, you have a minority, ethnic minority, ethnic, religious, and political minority that is subjugating an ethnic, religious, and political majority in Sudan, as you did in Angola. Uh, two different forms of totalitarianism, one radical Islam, one Marxism-Leninism, both of them being propped up by Western oil interests. Uh, billions of dollars in revenue being generated in both countries being used by corrupt kleptocratic dictators who are oppressing the majority of the people and using the natural resources that belong to those people to persecute them. And uh, it's a tragedy that uh, American companies are involved. It's a shame that uh, our government has been more concerned about profits than with uh, human life. And uh, Chevron was a key player in both of those countries. Uh, we produced a program called Oil Fuel Genocide, which is just a short uh, uh, expose on the relationship, the economic side to the war, and how oil has been driving the conflict even as much as, as uh, the religious uh, jihad. Uh, you mentioned something about terrorism and the war on terror, and uh, I think it's interesting uh, to note uh, I was with uh, Dr. Garang a year ago. He's the head of the Sudanese People's Liberation Army. That's right. He is a, a, a born-again Christian. He's also the leader 
of the rebels. He's gone through a, a personal transformation since when, from when he started, and they were more Marxist-oriented, and now they have become much more Western-oriented, and he's become a Christian. And you're working with his wife with a Christian school and many other things, yeah, hospitals. What I was going to say was that uh, in my visit with him in December of 2001, just a few weeks, a t couple of months after we were attacked as a nation, he said, um, you know, we, we grieve for what happened to the United States of America. Uh, we understand it. We sympathize with it. We ourselves have been the victims of terrorism, and we've been fighting a war against terrorism here in Sudan since 1989, and we are waiting for the United States to join us in our war on terrorism. There's a close relationship between the Sudan regime uh, and the suffering in Sudan and the international uh, terrorist activities that we're facing right now. Isn't it interesting that we have an alliance in the world between these globalist uh, Fortune 500 type companies, especially the oil companies on the one hand, and international terrorism on the other? You know, people assume that big business is supposedly conservative. But in effect, uh, they're profit-oriented, they're not patriotism-oriented, they're not human rights-oriented. And I'm ashamed of the way some Amer supposedly American companies have behaved. If we had more integrity in our foreign policy and if, the, if uh, we were more faithful in trying to assist persecuted Christians in Sudan, uh, we may not have seen the events of September 11th. Right. Instead, uh, we've allowed this wicked regime to stay in power and to do what it's doing and to harbor uh, groups like al-Qaeda, and uh, we've been the victim as well. Brad, we have to take a break. When we come back, uh, I'd like you to share with our audience some of the things you've personally seen and experienced on your visits uh, to the Sudan, and uh, uh, you've got some tremendous first-hand reports to, to share with us. We won't have time for them all, but we'd like to get some of them. Please stay with us. I'm sure you'll find this very interesting and eye-opening. Here's how you can become a citizen lobbyist and influence how your representatives vote. Write a letter to your congressmen and senators. Speak out on a call-in talk radio program. Write a letter to the editor of your local newspaper and call the Conservative Caucus for more information at 703-938-9626. Hello, I'm Howard Phillips. The Conservative Caucus has been actively fighting since 1974 for less expensive government and lower taxes imposed upon the American people by the federal government. If you want to become part of our effort to reduce the size and cost and regulatory burden of the federal government, I hope you will call the number shown on your screen. For more information about the Conservative Caucus, write us at 450 Maple Avenue East, Vienna, Virginia, 22180, or call 703-938-9626. Welcome back. I'm Howard Phillips, Chairman of the Conservative Caucus, and our guest for this broadcast is my son Brad Phillips, the founder and president of the Persecution Project Foundation. Brad, you've been concentrating on the persecution of Christians in the Sudan. Some two million have been killed by the Islamic Marxists in the Sudan. And you've been over there on a number of occasions. Uh, tell me what you've been doing when you go to the Sudan. Well, we uh, Persecution Project is engaged in a ministry to the persecuted and suffering in Africa. We've been doing a lot of work in Sudan. And our focus in Sudan has been relief, development, and discipleship. Uh, we've been sending in crisis relief in the form of blankets and clothing and mosquito nets and cooking pots and tools and fishing equipment and Bibles and medicine and so on and so forth to assist uh, people who have been displaced, forcibly removed from their homes by the radical uh, Islamic uh, government. And uh, we've also been uh, supporting some efforts to develop areas of southern Sudan through different uh, vocational training projects and uh, a school that we opened earlier this year. We've got 360 orphaned uh, children at a boarding school that we opened and uh, we're going to be adding to that and have uh, 460 children next year. We've got a pastoral training project. Uh, one of the most exciting projects right now that we're working on is Christian Radio. Uh, Sudan is a country with 30 million people 
that have no access to any form of Christian media or any form of alternative media to the radical Islamic media. There are about seven Muslim uh, radio stations in southern Sudan in the garrison towns that are broadcasting Islamic propaganda 24 hours a day. And so we've determined that we want to help establish uh, Christian media, uh, not just radio, but we're going to start with radio. We've got uh, three transmitters that we're working on putting into place uh, in February, and, and we want to help uh, develop uh, indigenous uh, Sudanese Christian media there. So there's a number of projects we're working on. Well, Brad, I hope everyone watching this show will pray for your safety and for the success of your mission uh, as you travel to the Sudan. I know you have another trip planned. You had a very exciting trip uh, recently, and uh, on more than one occasion you've had some very close calls. Could you talk to us about those? Well, any time that you're uh, going into a country like Sudan, there are different challenges and obstacles. Uh, it's a country that is, is very inhospitable to missions and to uh, ministry because there's a war going on, because uh, there has been no development that's taken place since the British left in 1955. So that means that there's no communication infrastructure, there's no transportation infrastructure, there's no roads, um, and uh, whatever you're going to need, you need to bring with you. Uh, it's very difficult to access some of these areas. We're working in some very neglected areas that are neglected because they're restricted, because of security concerns, because of the war. Uh, they're more expensive to get to because of the lack of infrastructure, lack of roads. So you have to fly into these areas. Sometimes you're landing in an airstrip that was cut by a machete a few hours before you land. Uh, so there are many uh, obstacles like that and challenges. Um, but uh, we've been able to develop some good relationships there and, and have learned uh, some of the different ways to, to get into Sudan. And God has protected us. And uh, You had one occasion <coughs> where you became very ill which delayed your arrival at a particular location, and that was That's providential, true. wasn't it? Absolutely true. Uh, on more than one occasion, I've seen God's hand of protection, and uh, that was earlier this year. Uh, in the middle of a trip, I, I got violently sick with a bacterial infection, which uh, immobilized me for about 48 hours, and it just happened that during that time, uh, uh, the area that we had hoped to visit was, was being... Uh, attacked by the government and uh, so the Lord really protected us there. On this recent trip uh, uh, we had some other uh, similar type experiences. Uh, my, my wife had a baby in uh, May and uh, uh, I had canceled. That's your fourth child. That's our fourth child and uh, I had canceled my, my trip in May and in June and I was planning to return in late July uh, and in God's uh, sovereignty we had a medical concern about our little baby Clementine, and so again I had to cancel my trip. I was supposed to, I had tickets leaving on the 23rd of July. I would have been in Sudan around the 25th of July in the Upper Nile oil field region. And in fact, the very area where we have outreaches going on and our Sudanese uh, indigenous partners were there, uh, on the 27th of July, the government attacked the specific location where we've been working. So again, God, uh, protected me uh, from being there and uh, and those who we were working with were also protected. They had to run for a few days uh, through the bush uh, before they could get to a safe place. But um, uh, we, we see a lot of that and uh, there's no question that uh, uh, because people have been praying for us, uh, uh, God has, and in His sovereignty, God has just been merciful to us and allowed us to uh, accomplish our our objectives and safety. Those of us here <clears throat> can in no way begin to appreciate the suffering of the people there. <clears throat> the lack of food, I mean, e eating any kind of vegetation they can find, yeah. running from the guns, uh, children going for weeks without food or water, meningitis, other diseases. Sure. Uh, this, tell us about what you've seen. Well, this, this most recent trip uh, in uh, September uh, was again in response to an appeal from church leaders who were begging us to come and help them. They had been attacked in July when I was supposed to be there in an early August. Uh, we were unable to get there for a number of reasons, including uh, the fact that it was the rainy season makes it next to impossible to land a plane 
uh, when the water table rises, it turns the dirt strip into a, into a swamp, and you just can't land your plane. And they were begging us to come, and when we finally arrived, it was September 1st, it was a Sunday, and many of the people who came to our distribution site had been uh, running for four to six weeks from the government. Literally and, running. Yes, and they had, uh, a lot of them were naked. Uh, most of them had lost all of their possessions. Some of them were, had wounds from gunshot wounds. Uh, many of them had respiratory problems, especially the children. We saw a lot of children that were dying. And it, it wasn't shocking uh, for me because I've been to Sudan. We've made more than 60 outreaches into Sudan. Uh, to see that part of it, what was shocking was to see the joy of God's people in the most adverse circumstances and to see their, their joyful spirit and the way they were overcoming. And we had so many items to distribute, and we were very anxious to distribute what we brought in, and we expected that it would go very quickly. But instead of uh, uh, looking to receive from us, they said, Brothers, it's Sunday. It's the Lord's Day. Will you come and worship with us? So we had four and a half hours of a church service before they had any concern for us distributing the medical supplies, opening our medical clinic. We had a doctor with us before they received any of the food. And uh, that is is uh, what has always humbled me and amazed me and inspired me to want to help those people. You know, some people assume that private leadership, such as you are providing, isn't needed. They say the UN is taking care of it. The U.S. Agency for International Development is taking care of it. Is that true? <laughs> well, you know, uh, th it's not the way I was raised. And uh, as a Christian, um, I believe that it's my responsibility to be concerned about the plight of other Christians. And it's not the government or the UN that is obligated to care for the body of Christ. It's other believers. And there are so many things that we can do. And there really is so much that we have to gain ourselves and to receive ourselves as we fulfill our obligation to uh, do as Paul says in Galatians 6, which is to bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. So um, I, our philosophy is don't wait for the government or the UN to be a solution. There's much that we can do, and uh, let's and get about fact, doing it. And in fact, there are entire areas that are being neglected by the quote-unquote official sources of assistance. Well, philosophically, they have a very different approach and uh, uh, to who they will assist. And by definition, the United Nations umbrella for relief, the Operation Lifeline Sudan, is in partnership with the perpetrators of genocide. And so whatever they do, by definition, is impacted by that partnership. So rather than helping the victims, they're helping the people that are committing the genocide. And The, the, the UN aid is, in effect, a political weapon to help oppress the victims. Food is used as a weapon, and more than a third of that is paid for by the American taxpayer that flows through the UN. Uh, our organization is not part of that umbrella, and so we are, have no inhibition about getting to those areas where the people have chosen to suffer and to die rather than to live in the government-controlled feeding centers where they have a choice to be fed if they will forsake their faith. They have to surrender Christianity and become Muslims. If they will give up their Christian name, if they will give up their their, their faith and, and profess Islam and Allah, uh, uh, they can receive uh, the, the aid that we've paid for with our tax dollars that's being distributed by the United Nations at Islamic uh, government uh, feeding centers. Uh, our organization has chosen to go into those areas to assist people uh, that are living in the restricted areas that are no-go areas, that are no-fly areas, and these people uh, have very little hope except their faith in God uh, unless we're able to bring something to them. Stay with us. We'll be back after these messages and let you have some information about how you can get in contact with the Persecution Project Foundation. Here's how you can become a citizen lobbyist and influence how your representatives vote. Write a letter to your congressmen and senators. Speak out on a call-in talk radio program. Write a letter to the editor of your local newspaper and call the Conservative Caucus for more information at 703-938-9626. Welcome back. I'm Howard Phillips, Chairman of the Conservative Caucus. If you are interested in the kinds of issues 
we discuss on Conservative Roundtable, I hope you'll check out our website, www.conservativeusa.org, or uh, you can contact us by fax at 703-281-4108, <coughs> or write to us, TCC, 450 Maple Avenue East, Vienna, Virginia, 22180. Brad, how can people contact the Persecution Project Foundation? You, you've made some tremendous films. Thank you. And I know that if people contact you, you'll send them copies of your excellent newsletters and sample films and that sort of thing. How can people reach you? We, we want to be a resource, and that's why we exist. Our website is persecutionproject.com. Dot org www.persecutionproject.org. We have a toll-free number, which is triple eight two zero one five two four five. And if you, that? our toll-free number is triple eight 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 two zero one five two four five. And if uh, anyone listening to this program will contact us, we'd be happy to send them a packet of information and uh, put them on our list. Brad, I know you've accomplished a lot in in terms of quantity. How much have you brought over there? Well, relatively speaking, we've done very little, but we've had the in, chance In relation to, to the need? In relation to the need, in relationship to uh, uh, even other organizations, uh, but what we've tried to do is, is to be strategic and selective about where we've worked. We've had more than uh, probably about 70 flights into Sudan. Uh, I think in the neighborhood of about 250 uh, metric tons of supplies a lot of Bibles, and uh, we're bringing in uh, another uh, 50 or 60 tons in the next few days, and uh, we're going to, we hope to do and more. it's bearing fruit. Christian schools, Christian radio, Christian hospitals, yeah. orphan th- children getting help. I think, I think, I think uh, even beyond the relief uh, through the radio and, and some of these other development projects, we're going to make a big impact. Brad, we're proud of what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Dad. Thank you.